His face is radiant, right? And what is the commandment now, the, the tzivui that God gives him? When you go down, when you go down, you should put a veil over your face, right? And you have numerous artworks, mostly Christian, that deal with that idea. And by the way, the idea of Moses talking to the people with a veil over his face because they couldn't withstand this aura, this incredible light. And you should read it light, but it's an enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, in, in fact, right? And I'm saying in fact, you know, to suggest that this is an authentic event, but the, the in fact is the idea of how we, how we should understand the idea of radiance in the face. The same thing transferred into the rabbinic world where the priests, when they give the priestly benediction, they put a talit over their face so the people of Israel, because the people of Israel cannot withstand the light which is the result of that sanctified condition at the moment of the priestly benediction. By the way, exactly the same idea had informed Islam. And since according to Muslim theology, Muhammad is rendered the seal of prophecy, the end of prophecy, whereas Moses is perceived, or Abraham, and after that Moses is perceived as the master of prophets, Muhammad now is always presented in Muslim art as the one with the veil over his face. I charge you, go and check Muslim art. Whenever you find a figure with a veil over its head, in other words, a person whose face is covered by a veil, even if you cannot read Arabic, that's Moses. Muhammad. Uh, that's Muhammad. Mm. And Moses next to him sometimes, with his face revealed. Mm. Because now Muhammad is the one whose, whose, whose sanctity is, 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 is concluding the chain of, 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 of revelation. Just so you understand where we're coming from. At this juncture, what happens here is the king functions as an access movie. He absorbs the divine light, which is, should be understood as enlightenment. And then, what does he do? Blesses. Not just blesses. Really? He turns right. around, shows his face to the people of Israel, and allows them, figuratively speaking, to nurture from his presence at this juncture. By the way, this whole idea of a people who do not turn to God to face him, as it were. We talked about the prophets, for example, as people who are very busy, very concerned with the ethical deviation of the people of Israel. Did you ever think why Israel are called by almost all prophets a stiff-necked nation? Because that's what God sees. Turn, the prophets say. Turn. So I can see you face to face. You're a stiff-necked nation because the prophet now talking on behalf of God says to the people of Israel, that's what God sees. Your necks, your back. Turn. Where do, how do we say to repent in Hebrew? Tshuva. Turn. Come back. Show me. Then when you read Isaiah, he talks, eventually you will come to Zion and meet God eye to eye, face to face. You'll be able to converse again. This is why one of the punishments that rabbis talk about all the time is if you turn around, God will also hide his face from you. Hester panim. You're familiar with that term? Hester panim? Hiding of the face, which is in rabbinic understood as is withdrawing from the covenant and allowing calamity to overtake or what have you. We won't get into that. But what I want you to understand here is that the king is understood as a profound axis mundi, someone who perpetually negotiates this kind of a covenantal relationship between God and Israel. Yeah. During the time of the king, the king was on a higher plane than the priests in terms of axis mundi and, and um, communicating with God. No. The priests were like couldn't do anything because they didn't know what to do, and, and because there was uh, God's presence before them, and the king Solomon took control. So they took, uh, you know, and and and, and spoke and, and turned his face about and, and blessed. It depends on the context. If you want to generalize, one can definitely say, one can definitely say that the king is usually understood as a leader on a political level 
in a military level, whereas the priest is the spiritual, has the spiritual pulse of the nation. Usually also the priest is there in order to uh, be the watchdog of the king. So you can see it with Samuel and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Shaul. You can see it with Nathan and David and Bathsheba, the famous story, right? The, so you can, but at no point do we find that there is only one axis mundi. The temple itself is an axis mundi itself. I mean, the, the, the entire, so we have a plethora of axis mundis. What I want you to understand that in the Bible, the presence of an axis mundi is indispensable to realize the covenantal relationship between God and man. One cannot imagine a relationship with divinity, understanding the covenant, what should we do, how should we deviate, how should we how should we repent without the presence of an axis mundi of one, one nature or the other? Usually more than one. To this Usually day? More. Or ah, wait, wait, we're talking about the biblical. We're talking about the biblical model. Okay? Yes. Let's continue. Nevi'im, prophets, who would like to read? So fantastic. Go ahead. Hey, you read already, didn't you? Yeah, you Nobody? Go ahead. <laughs> loud, loud. Okay, here the Torah, Deuteronomy, is concerned with something that actually is, is really a problem. <coughs> Somebody comes and claims to be a prophet. How do you know that that person is a prophet? And by the way, we have prophets, we have males and females in the... Not, we have, so not just males. Somebody comes and says, God has sent me, and now you should do A, B, and C, and D. The people ask justly. They say, look, he talked to you. Usually he talks to you in dreams. It's a very solitary experience when a god speaks to someone, right? It's not like everybody hears. Mm -hmm. Usually they are rendered loonies when, when, they, when, when they come and say, right? So the people say, okay, we accept the notion of a prophet. How should I know that this prophet is a true and not a false prophet? What is the answer here? It's pretty, it's pretty uh, uh, self-explanatory, although in a minute I'll show you that it's far more complicated than that. What does it say, basically? Let's see if what he says comes true. Exactly. The, the answer of divinity is quite simple. If he told you that this shall happen, and it happens, then you know that this person enjoys, in so many words, divine endorsement. Right? His, his words are endorsed. And indeed, when we look, for example, at Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3, let's see if Samuel is rendered a, a true prophet. Who would like to read? Go ahead, dear. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and this lit, and this lit, none of his words fall to the ground. Which means? Everything he said came to pass, right? Okay. And all Israel from Dan, even to Bathsheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Okay, and the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, blah, 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 blah. So how did all the people know that Samuel was a prophet to the Lord? Because if you can understand it's going to happen to you, it happened to you. Sounds pretty, pretty simple, right? Pretty straightforward. Now, my friends, without getting into a whole course about prophecy in Israel and the myriad of complexities that stem from that notion of prophecy in Israel, let me just suffice it to say, first of all, that the misconception of prophets as soothsayers, fortune tellers, crystal ball handlers, <coughs> Uh, is, 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 is prevalent and it's completely wrong. Prophets in the biblical narrative have no knowledge of the future, but rather have a knowledge or an insight of a possible future depending on the behavior in the present. Mm -hmm. In other words, they come and say, look, God wants you to go from A to C. You decided to go from A to D. And based on that, since I have an, an intimate relationship with divinity, an acute sensibility to the ethical trajectory which God wants, I am telling you now that if you're going to continue on this path, in you're in trouble. However, if you repent, if you deviate, if you do this, if you do this, none of this shall come to pass. In other words, prophets do not deal with an absolute outcome, but rather a possible outcome. To make things even worse, 
If you think about it, two things. In the, in, 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 in the words of Abraham Joshua Heschel, a prophet is a person chosen by God to be rejected by men. 